Good morning, church family. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. It is Mission Convention week one, and I'm so glad that you're here. The Lord gave me this verse for today, Romans 11:29. 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And when I looked it up, it says unregretted. God does not regret the gifts and the talents that he gave you. In fact, he desires to use them. He desires to further his kingdom with them, and he trusts you with them. How powerful is that? Sometimes I think we need to hear that God gave you those gifts and talents because he trusts you. Take a moment and think about that. He trusts you with those. So today, he felt, I felt very strongly that the theme for this, this year was surrender to the call. And I believe it's a call to obedience, and I believe it's a call to action. We were created by God himself. He handcrafted us with gifts and talents, and he gave us a calling. And I believe this week he wants us to go from dreaming with him to taking big risks with him, to take that step forward with him into action. So today, as we worship, this is my challenge to you. Open up your ears to hear what he wants to say to you. Open up your hearts to hear what he wants to do with you, through you, in you, as you're ministering unto him, he is so faithful to speak to you. So listen, as you worship, as you cry out to him, as you minister to him, listen. Heavenly Father, we give you this service. From the first song to the last prayer, it's all about you. So Father, have your way. Holy Spirit, you're invited in. We want to hear what you have to say. We want to receive what you have to give. Lord, open our hearts and our eyes and our ears today. As we worship you, let us worship you in true surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open up in some worship today. How many are thankful that the Lord is always good? Can you say he's always been good to you?
scriptures say to enter his courts with thanksgiving. Are you thankful for something this morning? You know, isn't that a beautiful thing? Like, think about you get to enter the throne room and have a big old basket of your gratitude and thanksgiving. Let's just take a moment just to close your eyes this morning. And I want you to think of something that you're thankful for the Lord providing in your life. And if you can't think of an example this morning, how about just the fact that he chose to die on the cross for you while you were yet a sinner, it says Christ died for you. That should make us all throw up our hands in thanks to him and say, I didn't deserve it, but you gave it to me anyway, and I am so thankful this morning for that. I'm thankful for the breath in my lungs today, Lord. I'm thankful for my family, Lord. I'm thankful for this church, Lord. I'm thankful for the giftings and the callings that you put on my life. I thank you for food on my table. I thank you for everything, Lord. I give you thanks today, Lord. I give you thanks today, Lord. Keep on 
This next song is, uh, it's a difficult prayer to pray sometimes, but I'm going to challenge you this morning to read these words, to worship these words, not because they're just up on the screen or because I'm your worship pastor, but because it should be our heart's cry for the Lord to refine us, right? I was reminded this morning that whether you have been walking with the Lord a short amount of time or whether you have walked with Him for decades, that refining process can still happen, right? And I did it in first service. Is there anybody who has walked with the Lord for, let's just say, over 30 years that knows He's still refining you? Take courage for those who maybe are new to the faith. That those of us who have walked with the Lord for a long time are still in the refining process. And we will be in the refining process until we are made perfect in his sight when we meet him face to face. And for the refining process, if you know anything about refining metal, it means the temperature needs to be pushed. That the hotter the temperature is, the more impurities rise to the surface. And so when we, as Pastor Vicky said, when we put our yes on the table, that means we are laying our life down and we're giving the Lord permission to turn up the furnace. We're giving him permission to turn up the furnace on our life. And it's not a worldly furnace. It's not a worldly furnace that has the same consequence. This is something that his goodness will lead us to repentance. His kindness draws us to his side. And we can sing of his goodness and his faithfulness and apply those same things to the refining process. That I know he's always going to be kind and gracious. He's always going to be loving as he refines me. And how many are thankful that God has good thoughts about us? The value he sees in you is worth the furnace getting cranked up. And so this song is an act of submission. Putting your yes on the table is an act of submission. And I was reminded even in first service, that sometimes we like to say, well, God, you can turn up the furnace with this, but not this. Let's leave this area. Or to biblical analogy, the other analogy is the pruning, where we want to control what God prunes. And that's not our job. Our job is to submit to him and say, Lord, I'm going to let you prune whatever you want to prune. I'm going to let you crank up the heat and draw out of me whatever needs to be drawn out of me. So let's go to, into worship of this in the, through this song with that in mind. And you might be all in and you might say, my whole yes is on the table, Lord. Then you can confidently sing this song. You might say this morning, I don't know if my yes is on the table. And you might need to contemplate this song. And you might say, I know my yes isn't on the table yet, Lord. And you might just need to read words this morning. 
So let this song be your prayer. If you're really ready for him to refine you, if you really want him to refine you this morning, then sing this with all your whole heart. If the altar's where you meet us, take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here. My life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. Your fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire, purified. Go on and take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my submission to the Almighty Master. We put ourselves like clay in the potter's hand. We put ourselves in your hands, Lord. We submit to you, Lord. We put up our hands in submission to you, Lord.
is on the table. Help us in our submission to you. Holy Spirit, be that voice inside of us. Be that light inside of us that is pointing out things that need to be refined. And Lord, I am so eternally grateful that you are so gentle and kind in your ways. You are all forgiving. You allow us to repent. I'm thankful that you allow us to repent. That you give us second chances. thankful that you never just throw us aside, Lord, that you continue to see the value in each and every one of our lives, that you can continue to see the precious the preciousness that you see, Lord. So 
So, Lord, we ask for your help to put our full yes on the table. We want to have that ability to just put ourselves in your hands. Amen. And hey, we're just going to stay in an attitude of worship uh, for a moment. Sue, a trusted member here, uh, just feels like she has a word from the Lord to encourage you and build you up today. Isaiah 26, 13 says, O Lord our God, other masters than thou have rolled over us, but through you alone we confess thy name. Just have a very strong sense that the Lord is here um, in that area as Adam talked about repentance. He wants our yes, but there is an anointing this morning for addiction. And addiction always isn't just drinking and alcohol and other things that we can mention, all those they are included. But Father God would say this morning, and I sense his love so strong, that as if you would give him your yes, you have been mastered even by thoughts that you have struggled with for so long. And he wants you to know those thoughts aren't your thoughts. They're intrusive thoughts of the enemy, but it's become a stronghold in your mind, and it has mastered you. Whatever this morning you know in your heart right now that is mastering you, whatever it is, God wants to set you free this morning. And he would say to you, I have heard your cry. I have heard your prayers. I have heard you, and today is your day that if you would just, and I just hear this, step forward and receive from my hand this morning. My love is going to cover every bondage that has held you captive. Today is your day to be set free. O oh Lord our God, other masters than thou have rolled over us but we confess your name today over those things that have mastered us and we say no more. There is power, there is liberty, there is freedom in the name of Jesus today. Receive what he has for you. Yeah, so we're just going to have a moment of just contemplation. Just where you are. Encouraging you to close your eyes. Get alone with the master. Holy Spirit, seek and search us. Holy Spirit, seek and search us with your flashlight. the corners of our heart. Any place where something else has sat on the throne of our heart. Seek it out right now, Holy Spirit. Seek it out right now, Holy Spirit. We submit to you. We thank you for forgiveness, Lord. We thank you for forgiveness, Lord. Thank you for the chain-breaking ability of our Lord Almighty. Set the captives free, Lord. Set us free in every area, Lord. We walk in freedom. We walk in forgiveness. We walk in freedom. We walk in forgiveness. We walk in freedom. We walk in forgiveness. We walk in freedom. 
walk in forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us here this morning. Lord, I do pray for anyone in this room or hearing this message, that message that Sue delivered to us. This church has testimony of those things that were once addictions holding no flavor anymore no attraction anymore. So Lord, we are just claiming a total breakthrough in those areas and we are looking forward to more testimonies that rise up out of this house where chains of addiction have been completely broken never to be clasped again around your ankle. Lord, we're thankful for that this morning. Help those who are walking that out have the boldness to come forward with a testimony. And that will continue to ripple out across the kingdom and help set more and more captives free. So, Lord, we are thankful for that freedom and forgiveness this morning. Keep our hearts in this posture as we go through the remainder of this service. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen. You can have have a seat. On November 20th, we will gather at South Hills Assembly with the Pittsburgh South region to give thanks for all the Lord is doing in our area. When the body of Christ displays unity, heaven is pleased and the enemy runs for cover. Through powerful praise and worship, taking communion together, and an encouraging word from our guest speaker, Jeff Leak, we will encounter the Lord and experience the supernatural power of gratitude. First Sunday back in our newly renovated sanctuary, we will celebrate with baptisms. If you would like to be water baptized, just visit the hub and complete the baptism form. Then you will attend the water baptism class on Wednesday, November 2nd to walk you through the process. It's missions convention week number one, and we've got some opportunities for you to partner with us in sharing the gospel. First, tonight we invite you to put your faith into action as we partner with the Pittsburgh Dream Center to minister to the homeless. If you've never participated in street outreach, don't worry, you'll be in a group with experienced leaders. Just meet Pastor Vicki at 6 p.m. to carpool. Secondly, we're having a missions trip interest meeting on Sunday, November 13th at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. Even if going on a missions trip is just a thought in your mind, we encourage you to mark this date on your calendar and attend to learn more about our scheduled trips and see how God may want to use you. Good morning. We're going to take, uh, receive our tithes and offerings in just a few minutes, so I'm going to ask the ushers if you can come forward with a few pens, the connection cards, and giving envelopes. We did our secret sign in first service, so I'm going to have you guys practice this too. If you need a connection card, make a C for the usher. They were really confused last week. They're like, I need something. Just give them a little C, raise your hand if you need something. If you need a giving card, just raise your hand. If you need a pen, just let them know, and the ushers will be, uh, you can come to the front at this time, ushers, and then just make your way back. I was thinking this morning as I was getting ready, because we need to come to church with an attitude 
like this. Today could be the day. Today could be the day that what? Today could be the day that somebody gets called out of their comfort zone, out of their vocational career, into a life of missions, into a life of international missions, into a life of ministry. Today could be the day that something stirs up in your heart where you're compelled to serve uh, the homeless, the needy, those who you would not interact with on a daily basis. Today could be the day that you're compelled maybe to begin giving to missions if you never have before. What we want to do is come to church not just to learn more information, not just to, to go through a religious routine, but to really come into a greater experience of the Father's heart for your life. It's the same reason why we read the Word. We don't read the Word just to learn more information. We come into an encounter with the Father as we read. So even today when we do our missions roundtable, it's not just to learn more about some of our local missionaries. It is to experience the Father's heart through them, what the Lord's done through their life, to say, today, maybe today is the day that you would compel me, call me to something greater, something different, something more unique than I ever have before. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. When we think about giving to the Lord, we often talk about tithes and offerings. When we look at this uh, aspect of tithe, we really look at that as obedience, giving, oh, uh, uh, giving in obedience. It's basically saying, listen, you own it all. You've given me the skills, the talents, whatever is needed to supply for me through my income. So I'm giving to you out of loving obedience. Now, above the tithe is something that we call an offering. Now, that could be anything from our renovation project to uh, giving to hurricane uh, relief or flood relief at times. We'll do special offerings like that. And, the, and today and next week, we're focusing on missions offerings, a sacrifice above tithes that we're asking you just to consider with the Holy Spirit into this next year to give to the Lord. I want to read a few verses to you. Paul, who is an apostle and also a missionary that go, went on multiple missions trips to preach the gospel where it was not preached before, is writing to the church in a city named Philippi. So, of course, he calls them Philippians. In Philippians 4.15, he says, As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other churches did this. So what he's starting off by saying is this. You were the church to support me. You were the church. Whenever I traveled away from you, you continued to give financial help. Now, if we look in the Old Testament, we know that a tithe or an offering was given in the form of grain. It was given not in the form of money, but in grain and wheat and so on, or animals as a sacrifice. Here in the New Testament, they were giving money. They weren't giving Paul satchels of grain to carry off into the distant lands. They were giving him money to support his preaching when he went off. That's what our missions giving does. It goes to our missionaries and organizations, and I'll explain a few other areas in just a minute uh, where this goes, but it goes to support them financially as they preach in new territories. In verse 16, it says, even when I was in Thessalonica, I messed this up first service too. It's in my head. Thessalonica, even when I was in that location, you sent me help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. So I really like this. Paul's saying, listen, you blessed me more than once. Ongoing, you gave to me. And I'm not saying this so I get more money from you. He wasn't trying to manipulate them or pressure. He's saying, I want you to receive the reward that is due to you because you obeyed the Lord of giving this offering, this sacrificial giving. And again, we want to be that church that a missionary or an organization, a minister can say, you gave me help more than once. You obeyed the Lord, and now I want you to receive a reward from the Lord. He goes on to say, at this moment, I have all that I need and more. Can you say and more? And more. If, you, if the and more was in your pocket, you would be more excited about that. Lord, thank you for giving me everything I want and more. I guess we'll go on vacation this year. Come on, Paul's like stepping out, right? He was working hard as a tent maker, but he's also preaching as a missionary. And he's saying, I have everything that I need and more. He said, I'm generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. 
They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. So what he's doing, he's using Old Testament language. When they gave a sacrifice on the altar, it was a sweet-smelling sacrifice. It was an animal, the, sa- the, the smell of that sacrifice going to the Lord. Now he's saying, the offerings that you're giving me is also a sweet-smelling sacrifice to the Lord. It's pleasing to God. I love this. Listen, not every missionary that's out on that field locally and internationally could say, I have all that I need and more. In fact, you hear stories where they barely have enough or they're, they're just trusting God for yet another day. I don't want any of our missionaries, any of our evangelists or organizations to ever say that. I want them to all be generously supplied for. The last verse I'll share is this. It says, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. So Paul's saying, you've been faithful, you've given sacrificially, now the Lord's going to make sure that he takes care of all of your needs as well. What an awesome, awesome promise that we don't give to get, but we know the Lord's going to take care of us. Amen? I just want to celebrate, just like Paul was celebrating with the Philippians of their generosity, I just want to celebrate the generosity of this church over the last four years. You'll see what we've given to total in missions since 2019. In 2019, we gave over 114000 Going into a pandemic where people aren't working, people are kind of closed off, we weren't even meeting in person for 12 weeks, look what happened to missions giving. It went from over 114000 to over $146,000. This church family showed up in a year of crisis and pandemic and continued to give to missions. In 21, it went from 146 to over 172,000. And now this year alone, I just lost my notes. Here we go. Uh, through September, it's over $180,000. And we still absolutely give thanks to the Lord. And we still have a few months to go. If you're newer to Central, I want to quickly just go over, and we can go over this anytime. Uh, if you want more details, Pastor Vicki and I are available. There's six different missions buckets where your money goes. The first is directly to missionaries. There are 16 missionaries. If you go to our website and just click on missions, you'll be able to see each and every one of them in an online directory. Our funds go to them. Also, our missions organizations, we support 16 ministries and uh, and organizations, parachurch ministries, and funds go directly to them. Third is special projects. Those could be things that we plan to do, like when we go to El Salvador or when we purchased a mobile home just five miles away to minister in Washington Estates. A special project could also be when we receive a special offering for hurricane relief or a flood relief and so on. The fifth is, I'm sorry, the fourth is local outreach. So that would be ministry that we do in Washington Estates, the first responder appreciation banquet, uh, youth and children's ministry also receive some funds to do outreach and evangelism. The fifth is future church planning. Uh, that from, from the first month that I became the lead pastor, we started putting a little bit of missions money into that, believing that the Lord wants us to multiply as a church. And sixth are events and resources. It helps like with our missions conventions, bringing missionaries in, again, locally, nationally, and internationally, and to host them as well. I want you to understand this. As a church, we have found the things that we feel like the Lord wants to do in our church, and we have sown that in other people's ministries first. So, for example, we have uh, sown multiple thousands of dollars in other church plants that will never benefit us. Their churches will never know about it because we know the Lord wants to use us in church planting. For renovation, about a year before we began our renovation, the reason why we're over here, we gave significant sums of money to other churches who were doing renovations that could not afford what they were doing. So we wanted to plant seed in good soil, knowing that as we bless them, the Lord will make sure he supplies for all of our needs. It's a kingdom principle. Amen? So our prayerful goal for 2023 is to give over $200,000 to missions in all of these categories. We believe he's going to be faithful. We believe that he's going to find the right people as we support our regular missionaries and organizations. He's going to, going to continue to show us other areas and people that we can bless outside the walls of this church. 
Now, as you, as you came in today, you most likely received a card. And if you look closely on that, it says first time giving. Those of you who are already giving to missions, you are so faithful, so committed in that. And we trust that the Lord's going to continue to lead you. However, we have multiple new families since our last missions convention. So this is all we ask you to do. If you're not currently giving to missions, even if you've been to our church for a long time, just ask the Lord. Lord, would you have me to give you a sacrificial offering a little bit each month for this next year in 2023 to help benefit these six buckets that we've just explained to you? That's all we ask you to do is ask the Lord. He will work it out with you, and we'll rejoice with you again next year as we, I believe, go past our goal. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do uh, thank you for an opportunity to give. We obey you with our tithes. We're stretched at times with offerings that we give back to you. And Father, we just pray that it is all led by the Holy Spirit. Father, and we believe that we will be able to support the advancement of your kingdom as we do give to missions. And we are going to hear testimony after testimony of what these men and women are doing out on the field, locally, nationally, and internationally. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning again, church. It is Mission Sunday, and I'm I'm just so excited to to not only rejoice with you what your generosity has allowed us to do, but also to um, join with you in what we feel like is a prayerful goal of what God wants to do through Central. And it's it's so humbling, honestly, to be your missions pastor, to get to be a part of this, to get to lead this, and and I'm so grateful to all of you for your support and your encouragement. It's it means the world because God has a big world out there, but we have a big part of it, right? We're part of the larger body of Christ. So thank you for that. Um, the first thing I want to do is, ushers, you can go ahead and start handing out. that You're going to be receiving the missions uh, update booklet. Every year we try to get something in your hands that not only um, shares with you who our missionaries are, but also give you an update about what's going on in our life. We believe that we are called to partner with our missionaries and our ministries. And to partner with someone means you know what's going on in their ministry. You know what their prayer requests are. You know what they're celebrating. And so this is a tool, one tool, that we put in your hands to allow you to have that, that opportunity. Um, we ask every year the missionaries to share with us what, what has been going on, what's, what's positive, what's, what's something you need prayer for. Because I challenge you to, to read these letters, to read these notes from our missionaries and pray for them. Put this with your Bible. Put this with your, where you spend your quiet time with the Lord. And let's go to war for our missionaries and our ministries. They are on the front lines doing the work of God every day. And they get tired sometimes too. And they get attacked sometimes too. And that's where the body of Christ comes along beside them. We pray for them. We stand arm in arm with them saying that you are going to make it because our God is big enough and we're with you. Amen. All right, can I get that commitment from you? Can you make that commitment to pray and war for these missionaries and ministries? Yes? I need a louder yes. Come on. Yes, good. Okay, you said it. I have it on video. You have to do it now. All right, so um, I have another update for you that I'm, I'm, I'm not disappointed. I'm angry with the enemy. Um, we were going to go tonight to join Pittsburgh Dream Center in Pittsburgh. For street ministry. However, there's an a organization called Operation Safety Net who manages and takes care of the homeless people and kind of keeps an eye on what's going on. If you've not kept up with the news, um, gang violence has intensified in Pittsburgh, and apparently this weekend it has even escalated more. So due to that, Operation Safety Net has has um, encouraged that street ministry be canceled tonight. So that's what they have decided to do. And trust me when I say this isn't an easy decision. However, 
I may not be able to go to Pittsburgh, but I can pray. So my request to you is join me tonight here at 7 o'clock when we would be on the streets, and let's go to war for Pittsburgh. Let's go to war for the, the leaders of Pittsburgh. Let's go to war for the ministries who are, who are sticking, putting themselves out there in Pittsburgh. Let's go to war for the, the homeless people who aren't going to see our faces tonight but can still encounter God. Do you believe that? Amen. Prayer is not a last resort. It is the most powerful thing we have. So I'm asking you, will you join me tonight here at 7 o'clock and let's push back darkness? Can you do that? If you can't come here tonight, can you set aside time and pray? Because, listen, that's pure evil, and we have victory over that. And there's no weapon of the enemy that we can't defeat with prayer. So let's pray. Let's pray right now, actually. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are bigger than any attack of the enemy. You are bigger than any force of the enemy. You are greater and more powerful. So right now, Lord, I just pray that you would show us how to push back darkness. You would show us how to pray, how to take and bind what's going on in that city that shouldn't be there. And Lord, I pray for the safety of the people in the city. Lord, that you would protect them, that you would give them opportunities to be light in this darkness. And Father, I pray for the leaders in Pittsburgh, that they would know how to, to, to manage this and how to handle this. And Lord, I pray right now for those in the gang members that they would meet you that they would run face to face, head first into you, and they would have a radical encounter with you. Lord, we know that gangs, they, they thrive off of belonging. They thrive off of being in a family and feeling like they're accepted. So Lord, I pray right now that they would meet you and recognize that their true belonging place, their true acceptance is in you and you alone. And Lord, I just call an end to the violence. I call an end to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the run of the enemy in Pittsburgh. And I thank you right now for your Holy Spirit covering. And I pray for those homeless people tonight, Lord, who aren't going to see the Pittsburgh Dream Center out there, but they're going to see you. So Lord, I pray that you provide. Lord, I would love it if the, the gang members that you radically encounter are out there the next week feeding them. God, and that's not too big to ask. So, Lord, pray right now. I pray for, for the leadership of the Pittsburgh Dream Center as they have to make this hard decision. Lord, you would comfort them, but you would also give them strength and more fire. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you and praise you. Amen. All right, thanks for joining me in that. Okay, so we also have two new ministries that we have chosen to partner with moving forward. One of them you met the leaders of a couple of months ago, Jack and Sheila Harper in the Save One Ministry. We've actually already started a chapter here at Central, and um, we've partnered with bringing in a training with uh, Beyond Survival, and they have a chapter. Our goal is to have a chapter or a, a, a class or um, a group at Washington Estates as well so that people who have been wounded by abortion can find the healing and the freedom that God has for them. Right? Abortion is a top, tough topic. It's a hot topic right now, and people get very uneasy with it. But the reality is, is that God can set free anyone who's been affected by abortion. He can heal their souls, and he can use them for his glory. Right? He can push back darkness with their lives. So we're going to continue to partner with them and become a, a, a monthly supporter. And then the other one is the Philadelphia Dream Center. So we have the Pittsburgh Dream Center here today represented. And in the Philadelphia, there's the Philadelphia Dream Center. It's so cool to me to see these two ministries that share a very similar name. Same P, B, or P, D, C. Yeah, same, same initials. However, their ministries are very different in a lot of ways, and they, they, God has just given them creative ways to reach out to their communities. So we are going to partner with them. There is a trip. If you look at the list on the back page, there's already trips planned, a trip planned next summer. So if you want to know more about either of those ministries, Pastor Kurt already mentioned it. We have a ministry director on the missions page. So look it up. Ask questions. Pastor Kurt and I are always welcome welcome questions if you have any, um, because we desire for you to know who our ministries are. They're more than just a check. They're our partners. They're our brothers and sisters. They're part of our body. Amen? All right, so now um, we're going to move into the 
we're not having a sermon. We're having a question and answer time. It's something different. And I want you to know that I really prayed hard on this service because I had next week planned. I had next year planned. And I was really struggling with what the Lord wanted to do today. And he gave it to me. And this is what he said to do. And I, I, even during worship, during first service, I felt like the Lord said this to me. He said, um, this is kind of like getting a sneak peek into a war room. So what, what that means is, is in a war room, the military talk about strategy, about what's going to be happening. And what you're going to hear this morning is kind of some strategy, some, some behind the scenes of what it, it took for them to not only start a ministry, but to also persevere and see God through in the ministry to where they are. I think sometimes we see ministries and we, it's kind of like comparing ourselves now to Facebook glory, you know, and we see and we hear the glorious stories and the powerful testimonies, but we, and we look at where we're at now, and the enemy uses that to keep us where we are rather than stepping into where we're supposed to be. So I believe strongly that today the accuser is going to be silenced in some lives today. And I do believe, just like Pastor Kurt said earlier, that there are going to be some of you today that fi- that either hear for the first time you're called Or you're going to step past the accusation, the fear, the lies into what God has called you to do. So at this time, I want to invite Gary and Amanda Brogger from the Pittsburgh Dream Center. And Bill Burns from Neighbor to Neighbor. So... I ask them to speak um, because I think their stories are going to really affect, like, how you view ministry, and it's it's powerful. So, uh, B- Gary and Amanda, would you take 60 seconds and give us a, a quick intro into you and your ministry? There is more information in your hand. You got a handout that has a, their information more about their ministry as well, but this is just a quick. Sure. So, good morning, and good to see everyone. I just want to say thank you to Pastor Kurt and Sharice. I love you guys. Love your heart. Love what you're doing. I'm excited. You guys are awesome what you're doing and the money that you're raising. Thank you, Pastor Vicki, for your heart as well and just being a partner like you said. But for the Pittsburgh Dream Center, it's pretty simple. Our mission is to really reach out and touch people right where they're at, to serve with generosity, to let people know how much we truly care for them, which gives us a platform to Share Jesus Christ. So it's through simple acts of kindness, just showing up, loving our city, loving our neighborhoods on the east side of Pittsburgh, being willing to go where the need is, being willing to spend time with people, because we know, without a shadow of a doubt, that God has a plan and purpose for every person's life. And we're there to be remi- to remind them, through your brokenness of addiction, through your brokenness of homelessness, whatever situation, you haven't been forgotten, that God still loves you, and you, each of you have a mission, a calling as well, to be the light of the world. So when I look across this room today, I see missionaries going throughout this um, city of Houston, throughout Washington County, wherever you may live. So thank you for being here. All right, Bill, your turn. Hi, good morning, Central family, amen. Um, as Pastor Gary is representing uh, Pittsburgh and the Dream Center, uh, I am proud and, and humbled and honored to represent Washington. You know, d- missionary work doesn't necessarily mean it has to be all the way across the world to be effective and have a need. Uh, in representing neighbor to neighbor, we are a local community outreach based and housed and operating here in Washington County. So we present, as I like to say, neutral territory as Christians to come together under the banner of Jesus and Jesus alone to serve our neighbors right where we're at. And, and we're just so fortunate again with Pastor Kurt, Therese, thank you so much for the support, the friendship, and Pastor Vicki, we've been in some battles together, right? So, and I, I'm thankful and to be able to continue to do that, and more than anything is to offer an invitation to you to come and serve as well at this event. That's good. All right, well, I gave them some specific questions, and they already knew them, but it's a surprise what they say, so I'm going to get right into it. The first question is... Um, and Amanda or Gary, whichever, tell us about your call to this specific ministry. What did God say to you about it? How did he get your attention? How did he get you to say yes? I think uh, for us, we attended regularly. You know, I grew up in a household where if the church doors were open, you were to be there. (laughs) And I personally was, like, condemned if you weren't there. And I probably 
did that to people around me, so forgive me. I know I'm being crass. <laughs> but um, God really started to work on our hearts that my relationship with him was about more than just checking off my church box and attending. There was something more that I was supposed to do and participate in when I exited the church. And in that uh, desire, it took us to Oral Roberts University, a thousand miles away, to pursue actual, my husband, a ministry degree. But while we were there, we interacted with the Tulsa Dream Center, and we saw that there is more. There is more than just coming and attending, like Pastor Kurt said, an information exchange. Like the pastor talking to you, you receive a message, but it's like, I need to digest this message and do something with it. And so, I mean, it started for us. We were at Praise Assembly before we headed to Oklahoma, and I mean, I can remember before we even ever knew we were going to be doing anything like Dream Center or what that even was, he would be like, hey, I see homeless people when I'm going to work. He worked in the city of Pittsburgh. And so I can remember we would stop at the grocery store and we were like, what do we put in the bag? What would be good? And it was like nothing that had to be prepared. They had to think about it and everything ready made. And that way he would put it in his trunk when we went down and then give it to the people. And then I can remember working with the young adults there, and we would go to Salvation Army and serve meals. There was just something. David Wilkerson, has anyone ever seen the cross and the switchblade? Nope. All right, y'all. That country preacher was like, I got a call, and I need to go tell. Can I get a witness? <laughs> yes. We all have a story we can testify, and that is what we're called to do. Receive from God and share his goodness. And it changed our lives. Amen. That's great. All right, Mr. Bill, your turn. Well, their vision and mission changed my life. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. Growing up here, you know, I went through a season of prodigal living um, and found myself back in, in the grace of God. For years, I, I lived apart from the Lord, and a friend of mine had attended a, a retreat. And when she had returned, she shared a Bible verse with me, and I hadn't heard God's voice in a very long time. And ultimately, it led me back to church. So, yes, church is still important. Amen? Amen. So what happened? Um, it, it began with me. It, it, the genesis of it actually for me started with the giving side of things. And uh, to Pastor Kurt this morning, I, it's one thing. It's, it's difficult. I'm learning pastorally, you know, give, our giving and tithing and things of that nature, it's, it's personal. You know, nobody wants to stand there and, and nor should we. You, know, you want to give with a gracious heart. So I had found myself in a position, for those of you that know me, I grew up in, in low-income housing. Very, truth be told, the very first outreach that we ever did was the apartments where I grew up at, talking about purpose. So being able to go back to that, I found myself in a position in life where I was actually making more money than I thought that people could make. Now, I'm going to preface this, and, and Amy will tell you right now, technically, I'm unemployed right now. So <laughs> I'm not still there anymore. God has moved it along. That season's come and gone. But I have what I need. Amen. So with that said, um, there was an instance come up, and, 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 you know, anybody ever had that situation at work where you go home and you little sour grapes about things? You know, things didn't quite go at work, or you didn't get what you wanted, and you get home and, I'm going to show them, or you go home and complain to your spouse or whoever, like, oh, they did this to me again, and they did that to me again. Well, I found myself in that situation. I was mad. So they started demanding more of my time, so I wanted more fruit. You know, the Bible says to make an agreement, work for what you labor, work what you agree for. So they were taking more of my time. I wanted some more of their money. Amen? That's how it worked. So I went home sour grapes, and I come to find out um, that the, the, the offering that I had suggested for my employer um, caused a great offense. They were very upset with the fact that I would be willing to or consider even asking for more. And uh, so I went home, and I reviewed my employment contract, and I come to find out that they had missed a portion of my income for three years. So the next day I went into work, they assumed that the same conversation was going on from the day before, and come to find out, I said, no, no, we have a different problem. <laughs> so I had taken it to my boss, he had taken it to accounting, um, and what had happened earlier that year, God had really started dealing with me about my giving. Um, and, you know, giving comes from your heart. He said the, joy, the, the Lord loves a joyful giver. And it's not necessarily how much you put in the plate. Remember the widow with her two mites? She gave more than everybody. So it isn't about the amount. It was about the obedience of the heart. And in, in talking about living a life of surrender, I surrendered that part of my life. I would sit in the pew, and I would put in my 40 bucks that I had in my wallet. But I know what I got paid that week. God knew what I got paid that week, right? And we were joking this morning a little bit. I didn't realize that your tithe was off your first fruits. 
10%, right? Free tax money. They were getting me on that one. That didn't feel good. So long story short, I'd gone back into work. I had started tithing the year before, and the accounting mistake had, had occurred. They come down, and they put a five-figure check in my hand. So I'm obviously pretty excited, right? That doesn't happen every day. So I go back to church that week, and, I'm, and remember, I'm giving my tithing, and I come to find out the reality, and, and God just whispered it gently. It was a week from the weekend to the exact weekend where I had started tithing. He gave me back every single penny within $100. I can't deny that. But from a place of, of joy and appreciation and just simply being able to give in that capacity to help other people, the reality was the Holy Spirit whispered. I didn't even get the thought through my heart, through my mind, but the Holy Spirit whispered to me real gently and said, what about your time? The money part was the easy part. The hard part we talked about this morning was not always feeling up to it, getting out and doing it, right? So that's a struggle for all of us. But the reality is, it started with me, it, 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 God really examined my heart, and I hate to say that, but he tested me. He was refining me in those things. So that was the genesis, ultimately. Um, and that reality we talked about this morning was birthed in a van on the way back from Pittsburgh, from volunteering with the Pittsburgh Dream Center to lead to neighbor to neighbor. So that's how that was. Yeah, God asked you, what are you doing in your own backyard, right? That was it. That was it. You look around and there's a need. Pastor Gary still says, if you see a need, you meet it. And that's that's the exciting part of the ministry side of things. And that's one thing I want you to grab a hold this morning. I didn't anticipate what was what was in store. I couldn't. If it was me trying to plan it, it was about me. But the reality was you're going to feel it's how God ordained this. He called this for this moment right now. There is a mission. There is a purpose. There is a plan. I mean, you know, you have to have the outline to get through the plan to get built, right? right? There's something in front of you right now that you can't see. Maybe I don't know where God's supposed to do, but he's looking for an obedient and willing heart. And the surrender part is what is the catalyst for all of that. That's really good. Um, I just, I love that you, Gary and Amanda's yes and willingness to go led to Bill having an opportunity to encounter God that way and then be able to start something new. Like, that's powerful, right? That's fruit. And I, I love, that's why I love having them together, because Bill's ministry is fruit of Gary and Amanda's yes. Can I just add the one thing to that? I don't like to quantify things. How many know Jesus came for the one? That's right. Are you thankful that he came for the one? Amen? In the last two years, this is my thank you. In partnership, and in, in I can look around, I love seeing the familiar faces. This is not an exaggeration. I don't have to reach for these numbers. I don't like to quantify things, but you want to see fruit. You want to see results. You want to know that you're effective for the kingdom. Right. 11,800 meals in two years in Washington County. Amen. Right. Praise right. the Lord. Right? That's good. We're in this neighborhood right now. Um, we hand out brand new coats. We're finishing the coat drive. This will be our second year. Um, in partnership with Central, again, through your generosity and your assistance and your labor, we're almost at 2,300 brand new coats in Washington now, Greene County, Fayette, Beaver, and Allegheny County. Again, amen. Praise the amen. Lord. And it, a result of that started with their yes. Right. That's so powerful. That's and I think, too, I want to, when you quantify it, I want to say you said this morning is when you're zipping up that coat on that little kid saying Jesus loves you. Did you know? Like, so 2,300 kids found out that Jesus loved them as well, which is powerful. Um, so what, what did you have to overcome? Like what, what did you have to overcome to make that, to, to take that step? Was there fear? What emotions? Were there financial roadblocks? What did you have to do to overcome and allow God to, to do in order to fulfill this call? Yeah, I think for us, you know, it's the point in perspective of life. And where is our perspective? And for us, it had to shift off of us. And I saw you know, career success in banking, was very thankful for that season, and it continued. But God dealt with our heart and arrested us. You know, what about eternity? What are you doing about people's eternal destination? So in myself, it wasn't the title. I didn't go to seminary and learn gang violence 101 or mobile food bank 202. But it's what do you have? And what are you willing to give? Mm. And even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's hard, are you going to 
live for eternity and make a difference because it is about that little child getting that coat, looking in their eyes and saying, Jesus loves you. And the people that you influence, we know a lot of people will never walk through the church doors. There's people that you know that I don't know, or Pastor Kirk does not know, or Bill does not know, or Pastor Vicki, that you'll influence. So where's your perspective? And are you willing to go beyond yourself, even when it's uncomfortable? Even when you have to do it afraid, and I shared in the first service, there were times in my life that I didn't want to go out. And I'll share one quick story. So we were, one of the ministries that we do is Adopt-A-Block, and I started the Pittsburgh Dream Center at McKeesport 11 years ago, and it's simply knocking on doors, asking people how we can serve them. So... Once again, if you have a smile, you can serve. I'm all totally convinced of that. So I was knocking on doors. No one showed up. No volunteer. My wife stayed home. It was the middle of July. It was hot. My kids stayed home. But I went. And I didn't want to go. I had sour grapes. But I went and mowed six lawns for a lot of the elderly and single moms. And God said, are you going to serve one more person? I said, no, Lord. I did my six. I'm good enough. I'm ready to go. He said, Go. So I went and knocked on the door. I never knocked on the door, and I just simply introduced myself. And I said, if, if it's possible, I'd like to bless you and just mow your lawn. And they said yes. And after that encounter, I had an opportunity to lead that person to Jesus. So it wasn't a platform. It wasn't a microphone. I didn't carry my Bible. I was just carrying Jesus and his glory and asking people. So don't make it complex. Don't make it hard. Do it even when it's hard and uncomfortable, inconvenient. But you can do it. We're all called to do it. Amen. How about you, Bill? It comes back to, you know, the, 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 the willingness and settling it. Um, I, I love the story. There was a time when we, when we had started with Midnight Call. Uh, boy, it can be deflating. Things can be deflating in ministry. Don't let that discourage you. You know, to me, those were the exciting times because it was out of the ordinary. Something unique was about to happen when those times where we have our mindset and our thought of how this is supposed to look, what this is supposed to Anybody ever get caught up in that? You know, what you think it's going to be. And then when you get there and you show up and God makes it completely different than what you anticipated. So we had gone out and volunteered uh, at the Dream Center. We were doing the midnight call. It, had just gotten to, it hadn't even gotten to a weekly ministry yet. And I remember showing up that day and there was three people. <laughs> and you think, Lord, what do we do? And we took our snapshot, our, our, you know, our Facebook selfie with our three of us, and marched forward. And now, again, to that ministry, uh, and, and I say this humbly to be able to be there with you two, um, you know, that ministry went from three people on the corner that night to meeting every week with sometimes you'll see five, sometimes you'll see 50 volunteers. But that ministry has been rock solid since 2013, and it has changed the life of not hundreds, probably thousands of people at different times. So the willingness to be able to just settle it, surrender, and go. That's really good. All right, Amanda, what has been the hardest part of your ministry, and what has continued to give you the drive to, to, to continue it, not to give up? Yeah, I think um, so what we do, it requires labor, like work. So a lot of, um, we pick up thousands of pounds of food, you know, for our mobile food bank. And you go and you pack them up and then you go to the neighborhood where you're serving and you unload them. So it's a lot of physical work. And sometimes the labor of that, my body is like, I do not want to do this. But God, you know, as we sit with him, I can't stress this enough. He tells us in Matthew, there's this wonderful invitation that Jesus gives to us. Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And I think sometimes we can get stuck in the follow, where all I'm doing is attending the meetings, and I'm getting more of God, I'm getting more of God, but then I'm not fishing. So we've got to be well balanced. We've got to continue following and continue fishing. And it's so important for us, you know, so Matthew 25, I think, was fire in my bones, when we have this moment where Jesus is telling the believers, I'm going to separate you all. Some are going to be sheep and some are going to be goats. And what separated them was their serve. We cannot be in this world and think that, oh, I can be this dim light. He's called you to be the light of the world. And so knowing that, there became an accountability in me as I sat with him that I needed to go. 
And I know I shared earlier, and sometimes I just feel like sometimes our lives feel so broken. Like in the season where Bill was out there serving, I didn't get to really serve a lot with Bill because my son was in crisis. Our household was in crisis. I was like, God, how is it that you called us to reach the broken? And my own kid, I'm losing him. He was like sand in my hands. And I wasn't seeing like my prayers, the things we declared over our kids. We are word of faith people, and yet I'm watching my children walk away from God. And I'm like, how is this okay? And the amazing story for me is that God was raising up Bill, who was going to go to Washington County. This was about way more than just the broccoli. And you got to realize the call of God on your life, it impacts more than just yourself. Your yes goes beyond you, beyond your family. So just do it. And, and I'm thinking about Jesus. I know I shared this this morning, but God's bringing it back to me again. When we go through loss and we're uncomfortable, the Lord reminded me in Mark 6 of Jesus, upon hearing the news of his beloved cousin, who his head was just cut off, John the Baptist, and he was telling the disciples, come away with me. You know, there's this moment where he just wanted to, he was a whole man like us, but yet he was fully God that there to come away, and upon that moment when they get to where they were to go away, there was a multitude awaiting them. Mm -hmm. And in Jesus' words, he said, he was compelled. I felt like the church said this morning, what you're doing, your flesh will fight you on it. But when you sit with Jesus, he is going to compel you to go beyond yourself. And in that moment, and guess what? There was a loss, but there was a miracle that happened because that's when he fed the multitude with a little bit of fish and bread. Let God's miracle be at work in and through you. Amen. So that is so good. All right, Bill, same question to you. What, it, what keeps you moving when things get hard, and what is something hard that you've faced? We all face adversity. You know, is it, in this flesh, it's going to happen. Jesus right. said those things are going to happen. And you know what? This has changed a little bit because of the information that we got just a little while ago about the alert that was given. You know, the, the Bible teaches us in Matthew, you know, when, when they, the disciples ask him, well, how will we know when the end of the age is coming? You know, and he starts talking about all these terrible things, pestilence and famine and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars. But then he digs on further into matters of the heart. And let me encourage you. Jesus said, the love of many will wax cold due to lawlessness. You know, as a warning, not necessarily to the world, but to us as believers. Do not let the lawlessness of this world cause your heart to wax that's cold. Good. That's so good. That's, a, that's not a warning. That's a stern reminder from the Bible, from the Lord. We're fighting a, a fight that's unprecedented. It's unknown. It's, un, it's territory that we, we don't walk. And I've sat in their shoes. And I can tell you now, when you get those messages, they may not look like it, but it's discouraging because we want to serve. We're compelled right. to go do that. Right. So my heart breaks because I've seen the other side of that. We talked this morning about, you know, sometimes the blessing is on the other side of the obedience. Amen? Mm -hmm. They want to be obedient. They want to serve. You want to serve. You want to go out. So we are not going to give the devil that foothold. Right. It's not going to happen. But please as Christians, as brothers, as sisters. God is calling you right now. And again, whatever that looks like, you have to settle that in your heart and be committed to it. When you fall, amen? amen. When you fall, I assure you, he's still there. That's right. He said, until the end of the age, I'm with you. So let me encourage you, and please take that in your heart, hide it, be prepared, because things are going to happen that we've never had to experience or deal with before. And because of the lawlessness, the love of many will wax cold. Do not let your love for others wax cold. It's the only thing I could tell you. That's good. That's good. Both of you um, kind of hinted at this in, in, in what you said, is you're not led by your feelings. You're not led by the circumstances in your life. You're, you're led by that secret place with the Lord, letting him fill you up and being compelled and that's what I heard from, from both of you is, or all three of you, is that we're not always going to feel like it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even, you even hit it on it. Sometimes things in our life seem like they disqualify us because look at what is right in front of me, God. How could I possibly? And he says, but it's so much bigger than you. 
So that's powerful right there. And I think that I really believe that that is speaking to somebody in this room or on live stream that the accuser has been telling you that because of how you feel or because of what's happening in your life, you're disqualified or it's not for now. And God is totally saying that's that's a lie from the pit of hell. And he wants to deliver you from that. Amen. All right. So we're, we're wrapping up now. And so my final question is this. We've heard all this. What would be your advice? What would be the, the, what you would say to someone who God is knocking on their heart? God is saying to them, like, I've called you to this. I want, I, I want you to step out in this. And maybe they're afraid. Maybe they can't see how it's going to work. Maybe they're just really struggling. The accuser's voice is super loud right now. What would you say to them? Yeah, I'll go first. And just once again, just to encourage you, I think, honestly, you've got to surrender surrender your life, and live on mission. It's not something we do on a weekly basis or a weekend basis. It's how we live our life. And those opportunities that God gives us, we need to be ready and active. And like Pastor Vicki said, we may not have it all together, but he does. And if we're willing to allow God through our mess, use us, he will. And my wife Amanda shared, at Dream Center, we have a saying, you got to be real, because fake is exhausting. And in our brokenness of life, we had an opportunity, and I was um, preaching at Dream Center Church, and we're going through this terrible and trying time, and I looked at everybody, and I didn't want to be there. I wanted to go home and cry. But God said, either you do it afraid and in your brokenness, or don't do it at all. Mm. So I shared our story, that we were hurting, we were broken as a family. I didn't know what to do, and that changed everything for us for ministry, the culture that God allowed us to create. People were able to be free. And I've done that one-on-one. -on -one. It's called the ministry of presence. And I'm pretty safe to say I think everybody has two ears. So what do you have? What can you give? It's a ministry of presence. Just showing up in someone's life. Amen. Being that neighbor to the people that live around you. Being that friend to some people here that you know there's um, that needs to be reconciliation or hurt, or brokenness, family members, whoever it is, to invest. What are you we living for? Are we living on mission and for eternity? Are we living for ourselves? So I encourage you in that. All right, so I would say make sure that you have a support system. If you have something that God's put in your heart, get yourself a prayer warrior to do life with you so that way you're not alone because the enemy loves to attack an isolated person but when you've got a band of brothers or some sisters you can do life with right. it is wonderful and i, I want to encourage you that if you're not quite there yet to step out into your own ministry go minister with someone else right go walk with someone else and when you do have your own ministry, don't be afraid to lock arms with other ministries right. because we need each other. We need the unity. This isn't about my label being on this thing. This is about kingdom work, Amen. and it's about the broken people being able to see Jesus. And who are they going to see it if the body of Christ is not out there? This, you come here, you said earlier, for the <laughs> equipping. You're here to get ready to go. Church begins when you exit the doors. That's he right. said, go, therefore, and make disciples. You're not to just camp here. That's right. We've got to go. And so let God just set fire up in your bones Amen. so that you can go and do whatever it is that he's called you to do. And it could be baking some cookies. It can be having a happy attitude when you go through the line at Walmart and you had to wait for someone that took a long time. <laughs> There is so many ways that God desires to use you and pray for people. Pray for people. We just don't pray here. We pray when we go out there as well. I'm not cutting you off, but real quick, <laughs> you said that. I never get to do that. I always get to do that. But one thing that God just reminded me of, talk about simplicity. When you go today, if any of you go out to eat, you can look at your waitress or waiter and say, you know, we're going to be preparing to pray for our meal. Is there anything I can pray, pray for you as we pray? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, we've had so many people that waited on us to stand, stand there and stare at us and cry and say, you don't know what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. So I challenge you in that. Sorry. That's good. <laughs> that 
that was a great wrap it up. Bill, we'll give it to you next. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I love watching this. <laughs> it's so funny. You know, it's um, the Bible says to each man is given a measure of faith. Mm-hmm. But the Bible also said that his spirit, he gives freely. Mm-hmm. There is, I love, when we're sharing, especially with young people, you know, there's no rules to minister. There's no bound. There's no limit. There's, Jesus, Jesus was as far from orthodox as could be. They had an expectation. They put him in a box of what he was supposed to do, what he was supposed to say, how he was supposed to say it, who he was allowed to say it to, and he broke every part of the mold because he loved people. He loved them where they were at, at the restaurant, in the line, wherever they were. There's nothing, there's no, there's no rule to loving people. We were joking this morning, Pastor Vicki says, you know, she's watched me jump out in front of traffic to stop cars. Well, it, it has happened. Um, and t- until I get arrested for doing that, <laughs> I'm going to do it. And you know what? The reason I do that is because I know how much Jesus loved me. Right. That's good. He wouldn't just stop traffic, but he would go to the cross. If you carry that love and that reminder with you at the store, wherever it's at, let me encourage you, don't stop now. Don't let your love grow cold. Find it actively. Work inside of that. Be who you were called to be. It's an amazing life, and I'm so thankful for it. That's awesome. Um, I think all of you would say the same thing. It's worth it. Period. It's absolutely it. worth it. And the other thing I want you guys to see is um, none of them came up and said that, you know, God called them from a burning bush or, you know, created them, you know, they had to have a certain look or a certain design before them to be used. You guys are ordinary people who put your yes on the table, and God is using you to do extraordinary things. And each one of you, I said it first thing, God created each one of you with a gift. He created you with talents, and he has a call on every single one of your lives. And so can we just give them some some gratitude for coming up here and sharing. Yes. I absolutely appreciate your vulnerability and your willingness to let us see behind the scenes. And I do want to point out that the Brogger son is serving the Lord faithfully now, sharing his testimony. Christian neighborhood. He is able to share his story of faith that it was Jesus. And I'm telling y'all, that it knows no gender. There are 60, 70 year old men here from Eastern coming there to get free. And he's able to tell them that he got free. Amen. Amen. It's amazing. We are so encouraged watching our son. Can I tell you, he sits at our dining room table and he reads God's word over himself every morning. That's what this mother wakes up to. Can you imagine? I couldn't imagine that when we were in that season. But today I look at him and I'm like, boy, you are the word of God in action. He said, Mom, God is healing me from my blood. So powerful. So I have actually asked them to pray over you. So what I would like is if if you if this spoke to you today, if God is speaking to you right now, they're gonna get in the front. Pastors, if you could join them, uh, retired pastors, you can come up too because you said yes to the call. Um, and pray if you feel right now that God is calling you out, and it's time to surrender. It's not just yeah, I know there's a call. No, I am being called out. I am called to action. I invite you to come to the altar. They know where you've been. They know what you're facing. And they know the God who's capable. So if you are, like I said, a minister in the room or a retired minister, please come forward, be part of the altar team. And if God is calling you out, please, please do not just sit in your chair. In fact, everybody just stand up because we're going we're gonna to worship a little bit as we close out. But if that's you come forward. Do not let this opportunity pass. There is an anointing in this room today. 
There is a call and an anointing. Or if you're here and you've started to step out, but maybe you're like Amanda and Gary and you're discouraged. Life has kind of happened. Things or circumstances are swirling and maybe you're questioning your call or maybe it's not even that serious. You're, th- th- you're questioning. You're just weary and you need a refreshing. You need a reminder. Then come forward. Do not let this opportunity pass. So as she, as, as Sharice leads us in this song, I encourage you, come forward. Come forward. If you still want prayer, please, please continue. Like, keep coming up. I'm going to close the service out in prayer. But if, if God's pulling on your heart, do not leave before you get prayed for. Do not leave before someone partners with, with you in this. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you're worth it. God, you are so worth it. You are literally the king of the universe. You are the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the master, the savior. And you chose us. You chose us. You created us. You knit us together. 
Lord, you're worthy of all surrender. You're worthy of all sacrifice. So, Lord, even today, as we, as we leave the building, I, I pray, Lord, that our heart is in surrender to you. Our, our life is a living sacrifice to you and you alone. God, and I pray that if there are those here that you're calling, but they're just not there yet, that you would continue to woo them. You would continue to encourage them. And, Lord, I break off every lie from the pit of hell. I silence the voice of the accuser and I ask you, Lord, let your voice be louder than any voice they hear. God, it would be louder than discouragement. It would be louder than the, uh, the, feeling of it, the feelings and the, the words that are being spoken, that they would hear you and you alone. And Lord, they would walk. We would walk with power. We would walk with authority. We would walk for every single thing your son died on the cross for and when raised back to life. So Lord, I bless each person in this church as they go, and I pray, Lord, that they remember their call doesn't end the second they walk out the door. In fact, it's activated. Their call is active throughout the week. Sunday night, Monday night, Monday morning, Tuesday morning. Lord, let us live in a way where we hear what you say and we do what you do. In Jesus, Jesus' mighty name, amen. Again, if you want prayer, please, please don't go anywhere. We want to pray for you.